What is up, nerd friends? We're gonna talk about five things you should know about your fresh Hobbywing install. We've done these before, and I feel like it's something that we can never do enough of because they keep coming up, and I get to talk to people about them every day on the phone. These are five very common topics that get overlooked on a new install, whether you be doing like an RTR upgrade or even some of the folks that are getting into their first race build. So the first thing I like to bring up is the basic order of operation, um, because a lot of times a very important part gets skipped and you're going to get a new system. You're going to first install it in your vehicle, then you're going to calibrate it and then you're going to tune it. The calibration gets skipped more often than not, and you can hook up a brand new system, turn everything on, and it'll function, but it won't work quite right, and some people never even know that it's not working quite right. So item number one is just to know the order of operations, that you're going to do your install, your calibration, uh, do a little bit of testing, and then do your tuning after that. The next one I run into is one that's near and dear to my heart because it helps with problem stopping or prevention, problem prevention. Mounting and soldering is a big thing that I run into a lot. And I like to use this nice kind of spongy tape and I use many, many layers of this on all my installs. So I'll do a layer of tape on the speed control, another layer of tape on the speed control, and then another layer of tape, like two or three layers on almost all of my electronics that I mount, receivers as well. And what that does is you want it so that the speed control, no matter how big it is, can wiggle just a little bit in your vehicle so that when the, the shock from the harsh landings, vibration and all that, they kind of get soaked up by the double side tape. And then the other part of this install related topic in mounting is the soldering because you're mounting your wires essentially. And a big thing that I run into are solder joints that cause problems. People are using bullet plugs, they're using maybe Dean's plugs, they're using EC plugs, stuff that can invite a bad connection where the wire is sort of floating above the solder, so to speak. So that you can, I don't know if you can get down in there, but the wire is all the way down onto the metal of the bullet plug. And that's an important thing that your wire, when you go to solder that onto any sort of connector, the, the, the plug itself is bigger than your wire. That's a big deal. This is an XT90. These are what I recommend for most high power applications these days, but that it, it can get all the way down into the metal itself and then you solder that on there. So we have videos on how to solder, but soldering is a very, very important part of an install. So, or if you're from Europe, soldering, so sorry. And then item number three kind of goes along these same lines. There's, there's a bit of a theme here and it's your plugs and your battery packs. I get a lot of folks that have shutdown problems, overheating problems, stuttering, all sorts of goofy stuff, and it usually comes from weak plugs. These are XT90s. This is kind of the minimum that I would start out with for most of the, the high power stuff, 3S, 4S. Um, in the two cell applications, I'm starting to use more of these because we're doing drag racing and some of the high KV stuff that we're running in the four wheel drive vehicles uses a lot of juice. So the bigger the plug, the better. You don't want your plug to get hot during operation. So so if you are noticing temperature buildup in your plug, it's time to start thinking about going to something bigger. I like to use these style of plugs from this company called Amass. They've been around for a long time. They're very affordable and they're made out of pretty good material. So there's really, there's not any knockoffs. There are knockoffs of these, but if they say Amass on them, they're usually the good ones. And this is the same brand that we install on our speed controls uh, out of the package. It's what I run on most of my battery packs as well. So good plugs and good battery packs are a big part of having a good time a lot of times i get questions like what's the can i have too much c rating what's the highest c rating i can have there's no such thing as too much c rating there's only a such thing as not enough c rating so you want to start out at least probably 70 c or higher for the most part i think most of my good packs where I don't have to worry about them are all above 100C. So if you can get into some high C rated packs, it's going to make a big difference on your go fast stuff, life of the battery packs, all that. For rock crawling, maybe you can get away with 50C and a little bit lower. But even then, I have seen some problems with temperature situations with the low C rated stuff. And, you know, it is kind of winter time now. So it's another pro tip. If it's cold out, your battery's going to shut down more often warm them up a little bit some hand warmers keep them uh in the house or in the like warm garage more so than in your cold vehicle and you're going to run them because the cold weather does make for lots of shutdowns all right next up is another one that involves the setup and it's your gearing i get a lot of questions about what should i gear my new setup and for the most part it's easy tiny pinion gear you always want to start out with like 
I could say 12, 13, 14 tooth size pinion gear for almost every application that's out there. Some of the monster truck setups are getting such low KV motors that they're using bigger and bigger pinion gears. But for the most part, the general rule of thumb with gearing for safety sake, for not overheating, for not shutting down, for being able to use your whole battery pack, full throttle, all that, is your pinion gear should always be much, 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 much smaller than your spur gear. So the gear on the motor should be tiny in comparison to the gear that's on the vehicle. It's just a, I mean, it's a very, very simple way of breaking it down, but for the most part, you always wanna start out with a teeny tiny pinion gear. Pro tip, that'll make sure that you kinda of always have real good time the first couple of times out. And then you can adjust gearing accordingly. In the world of RC, there's no such thing as perfect gearing for all applications, so you wanna have a couple pinion gears, so to speak. And finally, one that is very performance oriented and maybe a little bit of reliability orientation is power caps. We get a lot of questions about power caps. You want to know what they do, when they should use them, do they have to use them? And the short answer is you don't typically have to use them depending on how you use the vehicle. If you drive hard, if you drive aggressively, if you run at the upper limit of the voltage limits for the KV of the motor and the voltage limits of the speed control, you definitely want to add a power capacitor if you can. We offer a bunch of different power capacitors for different applications. They're, uh, they're available in module A, B, C, D, E. There's a whole plethora of them, but they're, they're, very, they're stated on there what they're for, for the voltage range and all that. So some examples of those, we have the two cell, like for the drag racer guys, power cap module. And then this is the non-polarity cap. And these are the ones that um, won't blow up if they get hooked up backwards, but they do not add reverse voltage protection to speed control that does not already have it. So for like the G2 series of XE runs, if you want that reverse voltage protection all complete, you can add one of these power capacitors on there. And then I guess item number six is get a programmer. Yeah. Some of the speed controls do have onboard programming where you count the blinking lights and all that fun stuff. Pro tip, if you're doing that, we have a unique blink for number five. It goes one, two, three, four, and then five is a long blink so that you don't have to keep counting all the way through 10. So it makes it look like it only goes to four and then it starts over. But number five is a long blink followed by number six, which is a long blink then a short blink. So it's two blinks, but it's two different types of blinks. Does that all make sense? But to make that a whole lot easier, just get you a programming device of your liking. For the Easy Run Max series, they could use any of these. It's the only lineup that can work with all of the programmers that we have. The OTA works with the HWLink V2 app on your smartphone. The LED cards will display the settings that are inside. And it doesn't matter what kind of LED card you have, just ignore the sticker that's on the box and use the instruction manual for your speed control. So let's say you got a WP1080 and you have the brush motor card for that. You can use that card on the Easy Run series or the uh, Fusion as well. You just have to use the instruction manual for the speed control to reference what the numbers mean. Just ignore the sticker in the box, real easy. In the XE Run lineup, the racing stuff, XR10, XR8, all of the, the, the tie-in racing ones, you gotta use one of these, either the LCD programming box or the OTA wireless device. If you do the LCD box, the only thing you may need to have access to is a Windows computer so that you can do the update via the USB link. And then you can also use the USB link to do speed control settings through the computer if you wanted to go that route. Uh, you can do the updates through the box and the speed control using that USB link and the box. It has to have the box and the program as well as a Windows computer. Or you can use the OTA. This is a Bluetooth module that hooks up to your speed control and allows you to do speed control settings through the uh, HW Link V2 app on your smartphone, as we mentioned before. Um, like I said, these work on the XE Run lineup as well. If you're into the plain stuff, the Fly Fun series or, or the yeah, the Fly Fun series uses the LED box. The Platinums use the LCD box or the OTA. So as you move through the rankings, you get a more advanced tuning option. One that comes up all the time is connecting these programming devices to your various speed controls. There's only like two or three speed controls in the entire lineup that connect to anything other than a dedicated programming port on the speed control that's on the top or if your speed control doesn't have one that says programming it will be the fan port so you unplug the fan and you can hook your programmer up through there and that allows you to do the speed control setting changes now none of the speed controls require the programmer to make them function it's just to change the settings so some of the racing stuff that come with the reverse not turned on so you need a programmer to turn the reverse on or if you want to adjust lipo settings or punch settings things like that 
it's a lot easier with the programmer for the speed controls even like the max series does have onboard programming with the lights and the button but just quicker easier with the programming box but that's it thanks for watching everybody if you do have any questions comments or concerns please do shoot us an email North America at hobbywing.com. We'd be happy to help you out. And don't forget, you can check out our podcast where we give away free RC stuff. Just look up RC stuff powered by Hobbywing on your favorite podcast service and listen to find out how to sign up for some free RC stuff. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time.